Welcome to part three of the German Historical Institute Text Mining for Historians course with Dr. Luke Blacksell of the University of Oxford and Dr. Caspar Bielen of the Turing Institute. In this unit, we're going to be looking at basic text analysis with Antkonk, basic corpus linguistic concepts and techniques. In this lecture, I'm going to introduce some basic concepts in text mining. Now, the foundational assumption underpinning all these techniques is that a speaker or writer's choice of words is never random. And this makes counting these words and observing common patterns between them a potentially productive scholarly enterprise that can tell us things about the text itself. This logic applies regardless of the length of the text. While it is true that the attraction of text mining or corpus linguistics techniques concerns the analysis of very long texts, sometimes in the millions of words, it is also the case that these techniques can be used on much shorter texts, those which can be physically read, to tell us things about them that might not be immediately obvious on a manual reading. Thus, a text can be analysed using traditional historians' close reading techniques and text mining techniques, looking at it through two different lenses to potentially obtain two sets of scholarly insights. It goes without saying that there is no consensus on how far these techniques should be used, or indeed whether they should be used at all, in the analysis of historical texts. Some historians will be enthusiastic, believing that these techniques can be as useful in the analysis of historical texts as they are in texts of so many disciplines, especially in the social and political sciences. Others will take the opposite view, contending that language is the most fuzzy, context-sensitive and nuanced of all objects of historical inquiry and the least amenable to automated and quantitative analysis by a machine. So let's get on to actually using some text mining techniques for analysing historical texts. Now it should be stressed that these are very much on a spectrum of sophistication. Very simple techniques more like the ones I'm going to describe in this lecture and in the next, can be performed with a simple graphical user interface piece of software. Our one of choice here is the software Antkonk. Other more sophisticated techniques, however, require an understanding of code. And these will be dealt with by my colleague, Dr. Kasper Bielen, in modules five and six of this course, when he introduces Python. Now, before we begin discussing these basic text mining techniques, it's sensible to become familiar with a couple of very simple text mining concepts. The first is that we regularly talk of searching not for words, but of lemmas. Now, in lexicography, a lemma is simply the canonical form, dictionary form, or citation form of a set of words. For example, break, breaks, broke, broken, and breaking are all part of the lemma break by which they're indexed. Now this can be helpful because very often in history we don't want to search simply for one word but for a lemma to be able to track, for example, references to patriotism, not by simply looking for the word patriotism but also looking for the words patriot, patriotic, patriots. The second important foundational concept, or perhaps better to call them a pair of concepts, is the word stem and the wildcard. Now a word stem is simply a set of characters which forms part of a word. For example, the stem of imperialism and imperialist is imper, I-M-P-E-R. The use of an asterisk after these five characters asks the software to search for all words which have those five characters and then any other characters after them. The asterisk is, of course, the wildcard. So, I-M-P-E-R asterisk will return imperial, imperialism, imperialistic, and others, thus allowing me to search for a number, or potentially all, of the constituent words of a lemma. Note that this is of course not a foolproof technique because that same combination of characters will also return some other words such as the word impersonal which have nothing to do with the lemma imperial. And thus it is important to always check these results before aggregating them as it always is in corpus linguistics. Now in basic text mining 
The first, and in many ways the most important, concept to become familiarised with is the partition of the corpus itself. It may be split into different sections. For example, our Medical Officer of Health corpus is broken down by time period and also by London Borough, whereas our political corpora are broken down by political parties. Fairly obviously, if you were to analyse the political speeches of two political parties together, you'll get very different word scores than if you were to analyse them separately. So it is very important always to be mindful of what parts of the corpus you were working with. What are you trying to compare against what? Once you have established a comparative group, we can now move on to actually analysing the corpus with a variety of popular and very simple text mining techniques. I'm going to go through several of them during this lecture. The very simplest text mining technique is the humble word frequency list. This is simply a ranked list of words that appear in a corpus, from the most common word to the least common word. A fairly obvious initial comparison then is to compare two word frequency lists, maybe two different eras, two different locations, two different political parties, two different newspapers. What words are ranked higher than others? Which ones lower? Now, of course, the vast majority of words in any corpus will be the small, uninteresting, function words, the systematic words such as the, of, them, must, want, I, etc., which is probably of relatively limited interest to a historian, although can be of very considerable interest to a linguist. It is very simple to strip out, for example, the top 150 most common words in the English language using something called a stop list, which simply means that the software will not display words in that list. Now, generally speaking, a word frequency list is of use for initial textual reconnaissance only. It may be a means by which you are able to notice a particularly highly scoring word in one corpus relative to another. If you've read large portions of that corpus, these probably won't come as that much of a surprise. For example, that the Conservatives mention empire considerably more often than liberals, or that malnutrition is mentioned more often by medical officers of health in the 1930s. As with all simple text mining analysis, if you do find a noteworthy trend by these techniques, it can make a great deal of sense to jump back to the text to find out more. It's very easy with the software to click on words of interest and then to see a revisited list of them in keyword in context form in the original corpus, allowing you to read them. Now you can, of course, just search for individual words of interest and you will see how many times those words appear in your selected corpora. In addition to single words, you can also look at groups of words, which we tend to describe as n-grams. For example, a bigram being two words together, a trigram three words together. This enables you to search for specific terms. For example, the bigram women's liberation, or liberal unionist, or the trigram civil rights movement. It's also possible to see common bigrams or trigrams just through searching for a single word by clicking the appropriate buttons in the software. In this way you can gain a very simple understanding of what other words target words are attracted to, although there are a number of other ways in which we can do this with considerable power and sophistication that exceeds that of engrams. Now I've already referred to it, but it makes a great deal of sense now to introduce key word in context or quick. This is simply a list of sentences where a particular word appears and it is displayed by the software as a list, enabling you to be able to see all of the sentences where, for example, tuberculosis is mentioned in the borough of Bromley, or all sentences where slavery is mentioned in the Times in the 1820s. Now, keyword in context is potentially a very powerful technique, simply because it enables a historian to see all of the sentences where a particular word is mentioned. 
Thus, the historian is invited to look down that list and see how this word is used in a variety of different ways within the corpus. Simply by reading 50 or indeed even 100 of these sentences, patterns may begin to emerge. And then, of course, those common instances can potentially be classified by the historian and grouped. So this means it isn't just a question of relaying how many times particular groups mention particular words, but also in what contexts those groups mention those words. So is it the case that the Conservatives are mentioning the word empire not just more often, but maybe in the context of patriotism, whereas when Liberals are mentioning it, it might be in the context of simple imperial administration? In a corpus of sentences about women from fiction, how many of those sentences also feature reference to a man, and how many of them do not in two different respective groups. It may be observed that the keyword in context list is essentially qualitative analysis. It relies upon the categorization of common instances that words are mentioned, but those are classified by a scholar. The function of the software is simply to collect and show all these sentences for the scholar, analysis and potential categorization. Another very simple and very powerful piece of simple corpus analysis is the simple collocate. Now, these are words that are collocated with other words. In other words, words that frequently appear either alongside or near, by which I mean, for example, three to four words to the right or the left of a particular anchor word of importance. Now, in order to use collocation powerfully, you need to decide on a word that is of self-evident interest. Now, some words in history are, of course, unique. If we are looking in a newspaper corpus for the word workhouse, that will almost inevitably be associated with workhouses. If we are looking in that same 19th century corpus for the word slavery, it may potentially be simply being used as an adjective, but much more likely it is being used to describe the institution of slavery itself. The word queen, meanwhile, might be potentially problematic, because clearly it could be referring to Queen Victoria if she was your, but it may also be referring to past queens, or indeed buildings or ships named after Queen Victoria or past monarchs. Now it is of course possible to get a much stronger idea that a word that you want to use for collocation analysis does mean what you want it to mean simply by reading the original texts or by looking at groups of keyword in contexts to make sure that with at least a threshold of say 95% that the word you have chosen is capturing what you want it to mean. Now, assuming you have found a word that you are happy with using for collocation analysis, you can then ask the software to show you words that are collocated with that word. Now, these can be displayed as a list. It may simply be that certain words appear within, say, a three-word span of the original target word, and you can count how many times these other words appear within that span. There are also some statistical measures of what we call lexical attraction, for example, the mutual information score, where a statistical score can be calculated which expresses the closeness of the relationship, which is to say how closely they appear and how often within a corpus. Now, using these co-location techniques, it thus becomes possible to assemble a list of words that commonly appear alongside other words. Now, this may be of great interest to analysis in and of itself. For example, what are the words that are commonly being used to describe trades unions when they appear in Conservative Party manifestos versus in Labour Party manifestos? But, moreover, Collocation can be particularly useful when it comes to assembling what I call taxonomies or controlled vocabularies. Now, this is also another very important corpus linguistics concept. This is because it's very unlikely to be the case that you can capture something that you want to capture in discourse merely through a single word. 
If we are, for example, performing an analysis of the issue of immigration from newspaper texts, there may be a number of words that indicate the presence of that language in newspaper articles, simply aside from the word immigration. Some of those may be context-specific, according to the specific nature of those stories, but there may be other words, for example, migrant, and also specific terms for particular immigrant groups. Now, while it's of course possible for a historian who has read a lot of texts from the corpus that they are analysing to potentially think of a lot of words like this themselves, and I think very much they should, it can also be very helpful to generate these empirically. This is where co-location comes in. By seeing what words are regularly correlated with the word immigrant, it becomes easy to find synonyms, other related language, which enable us to assemble a group of words, a controlled vocabulary or a taxonomy that enable us to model this issue much more holistically and thus to be able to much more meaningfully track it, much more meaningfully compare it across a larger time frame or across multiple groups. It goes without saying that when trying to track broad patterns in language, one of the greatest challenges of all text mining is programming a computer or setting up a piece of graphical user interface software so that your corpus analysis captures what you want it to capture and allows you to make these meaningful comparisons. Needless to say, even if you capture what you want to capture, there is also the question of how you actually interpret results. And that's where statistical analysis, which will be the topic of Dr. Kasper Bielen and myself's second unit, will come in. Another very important technique is automated corpus comparison. Now this can take many forms, but essentially you are asking the software to perform a comparison between two or more corpora for you. This is of course a great starting point because it can enable you to notice patterns that potentially you might not have noticed with the human eye, and of course you can use these patterns for analysis as well. Now, one of the most simple forms of automated corpus comparison you can use is the so-called reference corpus. A reference corpus is simply a preloaded corpus that your software uses to compare against the corpus that you are actually working with. So again, it relies upon a comparison between multiple groups. For example, medical officer of health reports in the 1910s versus the 1890s. The 1890s might be your reference corpus, the 1910s might be the corpus you are actually working with. Now your software will be able to show, using a variety of metrics, in what ways these two corpora are similar and in what ways they are different. The nice thing with this, of course, is that it is genuinely empirical analysis. You are not starting with a preloaded idea of what you want to find or what you are interested in finding. You are simply following what the software is flagging as being the key characteristics of the two texts. Now, the reason why this is frequently referred to as a reference corpus is because a reference corpus can be used to provide a frame of reference. For example, if you have a group of newspaper articles which are about Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee, you may want your reference corpus to stand for a proxy of what contemporary newspaper language in general was like at the time of the Golden Jubilee. This will of course allow you to see the differences in language that are in those articles about the Golden Jubilee compared to what you might call the general language of newspapers. Now in this way, even if you don't have an obvious comparison, a reference corpus can give you that comparison because you are comparing the language of a particular thing in question that you are interested in with the general discourse that surrounded it. For this reason, fairly obviously, a reference corpus can very often be considerably larger than the corpus that is your main focus of historical analysis. Now, with all these very simple techniques, it is of course possible to put them all together to jump from a word list to a keyword in context, to be able to jump from a collocate back to the word list, back to the keyword in context, then back to perhaps a search for a given word in question. Maybe you do a reference corpus analysis initially and observe some interesting vocabulary, then use other techniques here to zoom in further.
The beauty of simple corpus analysis software like AntConc that we will cover in the next lecture is that it enables you to jump between all of these simple techniques seamlessly within the same software environment. Because these are also powered by simple TXT files, it then is also quite simple to chop and change these TXT files, split them up, combine them. For example, if you have sentences that are about Margaret Thatcher that you found with keyword in context, you can take out all those sentences and make a separate corpus which simply comprises of those sentences about Margaret Thatcher. You could then do the same technique for a corpus of sentences about Neil Kinnock and then compare those two corpora that you have assembled, those two respective lists of sentences about these two party leaders using many of these other techniques. So in conclusion, I've listed a number of very useful introductions, some of them from helpful textbooks, on some of these core corpus linguistic techniques. But really, it's not so much a question of being able to do them, because that's very computationally simple. It's more a question of how and when you use them. Corpus linguistics and text mining are exactly the same as traditional historical analysis in the sense that sometimes certain techniques work well for some historical problems and some sources, but less well for others. I've often said that when analysing historical texts, looking at them through a text mining technique, through word frequency lists, through automated comparisons, reference corpora, quick, etc., and also reading them at the same time, as a historian is trained to do, that using those techniques side by side can give you sometimes quite interesting and different perspectives about a text. And it is sometimes the friction between those two techniques, one skewed towards the humanistic and qualitative interpretation, and the other skewed towards the detached quantitative using words as counters. And that friction can sometimes produce some very interesting conclusions. One set of evidence is not necessarily any better than the other, however, and there will be some historical problems where a great deal of these text mining techniques can be very useful and others where considerably less of them are useful.